Looking for a new playmat or some custom sleeves? You can support Magic Untapped in the process by clicking on the affiliate link for Inked Gaming in the description. The 53rd expansion for Magic the Gathering, Scars of Mirrodin released on the 1st of October 2010 and returns players to the plane of, you guessed it, Mirrodin, the artificial metallic plane created by the Planeswalker Karn. The set, with design led by Mark Rosewater and development led by Mike Turian, contains 249 cards, including 11 reprints, several new mechanics, and and probably most importantly, the return of Phyrexians to the Magic storyline. Speaking of story, it can be experienced by reading Robert B. Wintermute's novel, Scars of Mirrodin, The Quest for Karn. And while the novel didn't actually come out until April of 2011, just in time for the block's final set, New Phyrexia, we'll summarize the block's story in this video. Things are not all well in Mirrodin, as some strange corruption seems to be taking hold of the artificial plane. As such, planeswalkers Venzer, Elspeth, and Koth are traveling together through the Oxida chain, which is more or less what passes for a mountain range on Mirrodin. They're seeking out a friend of Koth's, hoping to find out more about the land's corruption. The group presses on, venturing farther into Oxida until they locate the hut of Koth's friend, Malak despite Vincer thinking they're being followed. Instead of his Volshock clansmate, however, the trio find a group of Nim. Again they are attacked. Again, they're able to handle themselves just fine. Taking note of the now fallen Nim, Koth and Vincer agree that they should investigate the Vault of Whispers, as that seems to be where much of the corruption is coming from. Elspeth has a flashback of being a Phyrexian prisoner during her youth, and opts to stay behind at a nearby shaman's hut. Before they split ways, Elspeth chats with Venser, telling him that she's noticed him showing signs of palsy and shaking from time to time. She asks him how long he's been dealing with the affliction. Venser, embarrassed, tells her that he's been trying not to make it obvious when in the company of others. Koth and Venser then depart, leaving Elspeth at the shaman's hut. While there, she gets some sense talked back into her. On the path towards Vault of Whispers, Venser catches a glimpse of whatever it is that he thinks has been following them the whole time. He describes to Koth what he saw. The Volshock planeswalker listens to Venser's description, telling him afterwards that it's probably just one of Mirrodin's mere creatures, and that they're mostly harmless. As they continue towards the vault, Venser takes a sip from a vial containing a turquoise-colored liquid. Koth questions him about it, but Venser dodges the question. Unfortunately, he was unable to dodge the attack of an extremely fast and aggressive creature the two planeswalkers encounter just outside of their destination. Both Venser and Koth are knocked out cold. Koth awakens first. The pair are bound on some sort of operating table. The Volshock planeswalker breaks his bonds and is able to get free, but before he can do the same for Venser, their hosts arrive. He hides and witnesses their nightmarish machine setting up to do something unspeakable to Venser. Koth decides to fight, but is easily outmatched. Venser awakens and attempts to get to Koth so he can teleport both of them out of there. Before he can, however, an explosion rocks one of the room's walls. Elspeth has arrived. The nightmarish Phyrexian machinations in the room never stood a chance. Things now having calmed down, and the group now just outside of the Vault of Whispers, Elspeth confers with Vincer and Koth, stating that she has an idea as to where these Phyrexians might be coming from. They take a look and find what can only be described as a Phyrexian army on the move. With this new intel, Koth suggests they should prepare to fight this army and to warn the other Mirans, those native to Mirrodin, about this threat. Elspeth and Vincer, however, disagree thinking a full-on fight against the Phyrexians would be foolhardy. Elspeth also comes a bit more clean about her childhood trauma with the Phyrexians, including how she eventually escaped by hiding inside of a large corpse that was being discarded. That's when Koth notices through the hole of the wall in the Phyrexian examination room at the Vault of Whispers the small silver figure Vincer had earlier described. The Volshock planeswalker shifts gears, and decides that the trio should follow it instead. 
They re-enter the Phyrexian examination room at the Vault of Whispers. Vincer suffers another bout of shakes. Elswith asks why he suffers. Vincer simply tells her that it's because of a great mistake he had made. The group enter into another of the Vault's rooms and come across Geth, the Vault's lord, berating some of his Phyrexianized, or completed, vampires. The trio hides and witnesses Geth's minions open a door on the floor and enter. Thinking he saw the silver creature go in as well, the group decides to follow just as soon as the coast is clear. At the bottom of a long and dark stairwell, the group comes to another room, this time with loud banging noises emanating from inside. Vencer teleports in to take a look and is horrified with what he sees. Phyrexians flaying the skin off Mirans, chopping them up, pulverizing their bones, and sending everything down a pair of chutes. Elspeth and Koth barge in after Vencer, ready for a fight. It's a fight, however, that is heavily in the Phyrexians' favor, and the three make their escape down the meat chute. At the bottom of the disgusting chute, the trio encounter a Mirren raiding party that has been making progress against the Phyrexians. Their leader, Azuri, tells the planeswalkers that his party could use their help, and that they will need his. Koth and company tell Azuri that they're looking for Karn, a silver golem planeswalker, believing that he is the only hope for Mirrodin against Phyrexian corruption. After a pregnant pause in the conversation, Azuri tells the trio that he has no knowledge of this Karn person, and essentially gives the planeswalkers two options, join with the rebels or die. Vencer conjures up a flash of light from his hands and grabs Azuri's bow, the display frightens off all of the Mirans, save for Azuri, who considers fighting them three on one, before two turning heel and fleeing. Vencer then has another of his fits, worse than the ones before. He takes out his vial and drinks from it. Again, he is questioned about the liquid. Vencer confesses it's a concoction of his own design that includes tree sap from Zendikar, some minerals from Dominaria, and Blink Moth Serum from Mirrodin but doesn't offer up any information beyond that. Whatever the vial contains, though, Vencer has very little left of it. Meanwhile, Geth enters into Karn's throne room. In the room, along with the Silver Golem, is Glissa, albeit not the same Glissa who saved Mirrodin from the Mad Memnarch years prior. This is a completed Glissa, fully Phyrexianized. In the room, too, is the Planeswalker Tezzeret, whose job, it seems, is to counsel Karn against those who might look to take advantage of him. Geth and Tezzeret get into a heated argument and scuffle, with Geth calling Tezzeret the Toady of Bolas. Tezzeret, however, proves to be the crueler and stronger of the two, and Geth backs down. Glissa then begins the meeting. There is, apparently, a being of all flesh who seems immune to the effects of the glistening oil used in the completion process. She tasks Tezzeret with locating and capturing this being, so that she can be studied. Karn, in a fit of rage, smashes a wall. Mirrodin's figurehead is not well. Elsewhere in Mirrodin, Vincer, Koth, and Elspeth are attacked by a giant Phyrexian Goliath. Vincer finds himself in a heap of trouble, but before the dark, immense machination can finish him off, metal components begin to fly off of it in every which way, as if it was being dismantled right then and there. Now safe, the trio looks to see who their savior is, only to see a smiling Tezzeret clapping as if it were a show. Behind him is a legion of chrome-colored Phyrexians. The four planeswalkers then talk. Despite the distrust between the trio and Tezzeret, with the latter saying that they can all help each other. That's when a few more dark Phyrexian creatures attack. Tezzeret's chrome soldiers fight back, and Tezzeret himself makes quick work of the mechanical assailants. Hoping this a show of good faith to Koth and company, Tezzeret reveals that the silver creature who had been tailing them previously is one of his, and that, if they don't work together, all that will happen is the trio will be left without a guide. After a rest, Tezzeret leads the trio into yet another room within Mirrodin's increasingly Phyrexianized substructure. In this room, the group witnessed some Phyrexians experimenting on someone, flaying them and cutting up their organs. The sights and smell prove too much for Elspeth as traumatic memories from her youth take hold. 
the planeswalker lays waste to every Phyrexian in the room. After the slaughter, only her group and Tezzeret's forces are left standing. Once things calm down, Tezzeret brings attention to one experiment subject in specific. The worst for wear woman, Tezzeret tells them, is Malira. He explains to the trio that she is immune to the Phyrexian infection, even when injected with the race's glistening oil directly. This, of course, leads Koth to ask Tezzeret why he's not infected if he's working so closely with these Phyrexians. Tezzeret simply says that he has certain advantages. That's when alarms go off. More Phyrexians are on the way. He directs Koth and company to one of the room's portals and instructs them on how to make their escape and to take Malira with them as she might be the key to stopping the spread of Phyrexia on Mirrodin, maybe even worlds beyond that. Before the group separate, Venser asks Tezzeret if he knows where Karn is. The Ethereum Planeswalker informs the group that Karn is even deeper down, then departs to give Koth's crew a chance at escape. The foursome begin to make their way out, encountering Phyrexian forces here and there as they climb. Soon enough, they encounter a river of molten ore. They have entered into Mirrodin's Furnace Lair. Tezzeret had previously told the group that Phyrexians of the Furnace are a bit different than most on the plane, as they seem to be a bit more free-thinking and independent than the rest. It's something that Vincert needs to see for himself. He convinces his mates to stop at the furnace layer rather than making it all the way to the surface. Koth, however, challenges Vincer on this determination as he does not feel the temporal planeswalker has the authority to make decisions like this. Vincer, however, is dead set determined on finding Karn before they escape to Mirrodin's surface. In the furnace layer, the group happens upon some rather large Phyrexians spewing molten ore. One such colossus begins coming right at the group, but then, just turns and walks in a different direction. It appears what Tezzeret had said about the red type Phyrexians was correct. They are just a bit different from the rest. The group then encounters a small ragtag band of Mirans. Despite the group's disdain at Koth, they're offered shelter and water as the two groups converse. Koth and company ask about the furnace and the Phyrexians who reside there. They're told that this is where the Phyrexians are smelted for reprocessing and that they think the Phyrexians of the Furnace simply don't see them as a threat. In a separate conversation, Vincer asks Koth why so many on Mirrodin seem to dislike him. Koth explains that he had left Mirrodin a season ago to seek help, but that everyone else simply thought he had fled, marking him a deserter. The Mirren resistance fighters take Koth and company back to their shelter, whereupon they once again meet Azuri. Despite a bit of distrust on both sides, Azuri agrees to allow the group to stay at the settlement so long as they are willing to help him should the need arise. Looking around the camp, the group notices a number of children around, and that many of the children are showing signs of pherisis, or the act of transforming from a living being into a Phyrexian creature. In one of the shelters, Elspeth is tending to Melira. That's when a child screams. So overjoyed is the child that her phyresis has been so instantly cured that she couldn't help but scream. Somehow, Melira had cured the child of her affliction. News spread fast and Melira had a line of Mirans queued up for her miracle. Even Azuri was beaming, as if the miracle had come from him and him alone. The resistance leader even suggested that they find a way to bottle the cure, though Vincer was sure it was only for Azuri to dispense at his pleasure for the right price, of course. In talking with Vincer, Azuri lets slip that he actually has heard the name Karn, despite saying the contrary during their first meeting. Apparently, one of his scouts heard before his death a being among the Phyrexians saying, the Golem cannot be trusted. Vincer takes that as a good sign. Days later, Azuri calls for a settlement meeting. During the meeting, Koth and company request a guide. They would like to venture down and find Karn, bringing Melira down with them to cure the Silver Golem of Phyrexian corruption, if so necessary. Azuri, of course, wants Melira to stay at the settlement and keep her miracle contained to him and his cause. The meeting is cut short, however, as Phyrexians of seemingly all types, including Tezzeret's Chrome crew, invade the camp, apparently in search of something or someone. Iziri uses the attack as an excuse for blaming Koth, 
saying that he had led the Phyrexians to the settlement and cannot be trusted. As the chaos ensues, Koth and company make their leave. As they depart, a cloaked figure approaches them and offers to be their guide, saying that he is familiar with Glissa's domain. The honesty and tone the figure is speaking with convinces Vincer that what he is saying is the truth. The rest of the group, however, is skeptical. After all, it could be a Phyrexian spy. The figure confesses that his knowledge of New Phyrexia's depths comes from an arrangement he has with Glissa. Still, the group decides to take the shadowy figure up on his offer. The group venture back down to the depths of this New Phyrexia beneath Mirrodin's surface, including through the ruined remains of the Panopticon from which Mirrodin's previous de facto lord, the Mad Golem Memnarch, ruled, encountering some skirmishes along the way. Eventually, they reach a room with large cylinder vats containing partially completed mirrors. Vencer speculates the vats could be used for breeding, but Elspeth, doubting Phyrexians have any need for procreation, suggests they're probably for speeding up the Phyrexus process. Either way, their mysterious guide suggests that they press on, as there is no way to save those within the vats. After yet another skirmish with more Phyrexians, completed angel-type beings this time, Koth has had enough. Stating that all the party is doing is aimlessly wandering, he departs on his own. Their group now down to three, plus the guide. Vincer has another violent fit. Elspeth asks him about it again. Vincer tells her that it's sure to be fatal, and he supposes he has maybe another day before it claims him. Then the pair notice that their group of three is only the two of them, plus the guide who informs them that Malyra is gone as well, as she had left along with Koth. The three then go after the other two. At least, they tried to. Vincer, Elspeth, and the guide lose track of where Koth and Malyra went, and, instead, find themselves cornered and trapped by a large group of formidable Phyrexians, the guide skulking off and leaving the other two at the Phyrexians' mercy. Just before Vincer is about to be killed, a voice commands the Phyrexians to stop, and that voice's owner? Tezzeret. He informs the three that he is searching for Malyra, though doesn't say why he's looking for her after giving her to Koth, Vincer, and Elspeth previously. Tezzeret then tells the two that they will be brought before Glissa to be skinned. They are taken prisoner, and Tezzeret leaves the scene. The Phyrexians go to take their new prisoners deeper down to the depths of this new Phyrexia, but reach a door that simply won't budge. The Phyrexians tap and bang on it, attempting to get it to open. Koth and Malyra approach and take care of the Phyrexians, holding the other two planeswalkers prisoner, after which the guide mysteriously reappears and resumes leading them to where Karn is. Then alarms go off. More Phyrexians are on the way. The guide leads them down another wall to where another door is. But when he taps on the portal, nothing happens just like moments before with the Phyrexian Jailers. The group deduces that someone or something has disabled the portals, all of which predate Phyrexia's existence on Mirrodin. Realizing that they must have been made by Karn when he created the artificial plane, the group thinks that Vincer might be able to open it. The Temporal Planeswalker drinks what remains of the turquoise concoction in his vial and, indeed, succeeds in opening it. The group soon finds themselves in a more organic-looking, yet still artificial area of Meriden's underbelly. More Phyrexians catch up to the group, however, and they are forced to fight. Luckily, Vincer notices some explosive material as the group sets up a trap with Koth, the willing bait. The trap works, and the explosion decimates the pursuing Phyrexians. Unfortunately, Koth doesn't fully escape the blast, as bits of shrapnel pierce his side. Elspeth takes a moment to mend his wounds, during which Koth apologizes to she and Vincer, explaining that he took Melora with him to bring her back to the surface and help cure the Mirans up there of Phyrexian corruption. After his apology, more Phyrexians arrive, this time led by Glissa, who demands Melora be returned to her. As the completed former champion of Mirrodin approaches the group, Tezzeret steps out of the shadows. This was not the plan, he says his own chrome Phyrexians behind him. Glissa and her Phyrexians stop their approach. What are you talking about? Tezzeret then reveals that he provided Melora to Koth, Vincer, and Elspeth as a means to get Glissa out into the open where he could kill her. 
and that he has been the one locking the portals to ensure she could not escape. He then divulges that, once he kills her, he will assume control of the Phyrexians himself, seeing as Nicol Bolas had sent him to this new Phyrexianized Mirrodin, and he may as well make the most of the opportunity. Glissa and Tezzeret's forces then clash. Koth and company take the opportunity to slip away unnoticed. The guide, whom always seems to disappear when trouble occurs, returns and leads the group down yet another tunnel. Finally, they're led into yet another room. Just as they enter, the guide stops and stands still as a statue. Elspeth checks his pulse, only to discover there is no pulse to check. The mysterious guide had been a machine the whole time, but one quite different than the Phyrexians. That's when the ground begins to rumble, and a booming voice echoes throughout the chamber. That sound is my children running to this place. The sound of all of their feet. Vincer recognizes the voice, calls out, Karn? I have not heard that name in eons. It has not been that long, old friend. Old friend, do I know you? What is your name? It is Vincer of Urborg. Vincer of Urborg. Vincer of Urborg. From not so long ago. Yes, I sent somebody for you. I'm sorry? I sent a guide to lead you to me but I cannot remember why. Karn then tries to descend from the huge column upon which he sits, but comes crashing to the floor instead. The worse for wear, unstable Silver Golem then gets up and tries to scuffle with the Planeswalker trio. Vincer then asks Karn questions about his past and the time they've spent together. Karn, now no longer trying to attack the group, still seems out of his right mind. That's when Malira tries talking to him, asking him about his past. Vincer explains to her that Karn once thought flesh to be weak, inevitable to die, and that he felt that way because, one day, his father left for the swamps and never came back, one of a series of events that formed this worldview. That's when Malira tells Karn, We are not machines. The real secret the Phyrexians are trying to hide by keeping me in captivity is that flesh is stronger than metal. They are obsessed with flesh for this reason. They cannot copy the strength. This is a secret they do not want known. Malira channels her energy to Karn. While the Phyrexian corruption that tarnished his body vanished, he is mentally unchanged. Karn's heart, the very same heart given to him by Urza that once belonged to the Phyrexian sleeper agent Zancha, was infected. That's when Vincer asks Malira if his heart is infected. Realizing what the Temporal Mage is getting at, Elspeth asks if there is another way. Vincer, however, tells her that he is dying anyhow, and that if there is a chance to save Karn, it's probably for the best in terms of stopping the Phyrexians. Vincer closes his eyes and turns to Karn, prepared for one final teleport. A second later, the Temporal Planeswalker's body falls to the floor. The Silver Golem's body gives a violent jolt, then lays still. At first, Elspeth is unsure if Karn is cured or not. Then Karn comes to, stating that he must travel to other planes to undo the damage he would have caused by spreading elements of Phyrexia to other worlds. But first, he has some business to attend to on this new Phyrexia. Are we ready for battle? I have slept too long. Mirrodin has carried my pride and also my guilt. You all have fought my battles. Now, friends, we shall show these beasts of meat and metal the true nature of their father of machines. And that more or less does it for the story of the Scars of Mirrodin block. Now let's get back to talking about the set, Scars of Mirrodin, itself. First off, let's begin with the return of the Phyrexians. After all, thanks to the Weatherlight crew as well as, technically, Urza's disembodied head, the Phyrexians were defeated at the end of Magic's invasion block. Utterly defeated, they are destroyed. Finally, the, the curse of the Phyrexians has been wiped from the multiverse. Now, for those who know anything about uh, good, good storytelling, uh, 
you know just completely kill off uh, villains as good as the Frexians. And, and, and let me be clear, I love the Frexians. They are my favorite villains. Of all magic, like, as far as I'm concerned, I consider them the Lex Luthor to, 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 to magic Superman. The reason I love the Frex, and I've talked about this before, is they're what I call environmental villains, which is magic does a good job of showing you an environment. And the Frexians are not just a singular thing, they are themselves an environment. It's very easy to show Frexia because they get to show up in lots of cards, because what they do is they infect the environment, and that's very visible. And with this return of one of Magic the Gathering's most recognizable and fearsome antagonistic races comes a suitable new mechanic, Infect. It's a creature ability that deals damage to creatures by way of minus one minus one counters and also to players in the form of poison counters. But this new mechanic, one that is pretty much synonymous with modern Phyrexians, almost never happened. We started with Poisonous, uh, which I used in Future Sight. So the idea of poisonous was the way most of the poison creatures worked uh, the, in the early days was I hit you um, and then uh, I did poison to you. I wanted you to go, oh my god, the Frexians, oh my god, the Fre- oh, you know, I'm scared the Frexians are here. Um, and I thought poison could do that, but it, it, wasn't, it just wasn't getting the job done. So instead of poisonous, wizards began looking at another past mechanic, wither which debuted in Shadowmoor. Originally, when we made Wither, it was, if you blocked, you got so many minus one, minus one counters. Um, but what we ended up doing was we tied Wither to damage, which said it dealt its damage to creatures in the form of minus one, minus one counters. Um, and that just played a lot better, because we had Wither on a lot of creatures, and Wither dealt damage in the form of minus one, minus one counters. And then one day, uh, it's just like, why doesn't Poison deal damage in the form of poison counters. Like that's, that's exactly what we want. Um, and the reason that that was so awesome was that it, it had the thing I'm missing, which is, let's say I have four poison and you attack with this 2-2 creature. Well, you might be able to make the creature bigger. You can giant growth or something. Meaning, I don't know how much poison I might be taking. I have to be careful. And then one day, we were just like, why, like I, I, most of the cards had infect and wither. And I'm like, why are we bothering to write Wither on these cards? What if, in fact, just had Wither built in? And it all just came together. It was a, it was a beautiful package. In fact, wasn't the only new mechanic introduced in Scars of Mirrodin, however. The set also introduced a new keyword action called Proliferate, which allows players to add a counter of any type already existing on any permanent or player. It plays very well with Infect's minus one, minus one counters on creatures and poison counters on players. Middlecraft, another new mechanic, gives a card a bonus if its controller controls three or more artifacts. And with this set taking place on Mirrodin, the Mirrodin set ability Imprint made its return. Also making a return from original Mirrodin are the Mirror. Specifically, we're talking about the cycle of mana producing Mirror, now reprinted in Scars of Mirrodin. Gold Mirror, Silver Mirror, Leaden Mirror, Iron Mirror, and Copper Mirror. Of course, these mirror reprints are not the only cycles to appear in Scars. In fact, there are a total of 10 cycles in the set. Perhaps most notable amongst them are Smiths, each of which have a triggered ability whenever you cast an artifact, such as the card Riddle Smith, which allows a player to loot as its trigger. Replicas, which are artifact creatures that can be sacrificed in order to get a color-specific effect, such as with the card Nurok Replica, having an ability that returns a target creature to its owner's hand. Spell Bombs, which are a callback to the original Spell Bombs from Mirrodin. These cards have color-specific tap and sack abilities, and also give its controller the option to draw a card when they're sent to the graveyard, such as the card Nihil Spell Bomb, exiling a player's graveyard with, essentially, a pay one black mana kicker to draw a card when it leaves play. Trigons, which is a series of artifacts that come into play with charge counters on them. Players can put more of them on for a cost, and also have an activated ability that requires charge counters being removed from them, such as the card Trigon of Corruption, putting a minus one minus one counter on target creature, and Allied Colored Fast Lands. These are new dual lands that come into play tapped unless its controller controls two or fewer other lands, meaning that there is a chance that they may come into play untapped. These lands are White Blue Sea Chrome Coast, Blue Black Dark Slug Shores, Black Red Black Cleave Cliffs, 
Red Green Copper Line Gorge, and Green White Razor Verge Thicket. Scars of Mirrodin also completes what's known as a Mega Cycle, or a cycle of cards that spans many sets. The original Mirrodin had four towers, each of them themed after a color. Tower of Eons, Tower of Fortunes, Tower of Murmurs, and Tower of Champions. With Scars of Mirrodin, the Mega Cycle was completed with the printing of the red-themed card Tower of Calamities. Aside from the cycles, Scars of Mirrodin also features a handful of notable and valuable cards. Contagion Engine, an artifact that can double proliferate. Golem's Heart, a life game triggered ability artifact that cares about artifact spells being cast. It's essentially the artifact-focused version of the Lucky Charm cards from Darksteel, such as Dragon's Claw. Molten Tail Masticore, a nearly functional reprint of the original Masticore from Urza's Destiny. Mox Opal, the then latest addition to Magic the Gathering's popular and powerful line of Moxen. In January of 2020, the card was banned in Modern due, in part, to its involvement in one-turn win combos and its synergy with the then-recently printed Modern Horizons card Urza Lord High Artificer. Platinum Empyrean, an 8-8 for 8 artifact creature that literally says your life total cannot change so long as it's in play. Scythrix the Blight Dragon, a powerful and popular dragon with infect that can also give itself haste and regenerate itself. Sword of Body and Mind, a continuation of the Sword of X and Y series that began in Darksteel. Venser the Sojourner, the only multicolored card in the set. It is also the one and only Planeswalker card for the character, and second card overall after the Future Sight card, Venser, Shaper Savant. And Worm Coil Engine, a powerful artifact creature that essentially splits into two when killed. It's been a win condition for a number of decks, most notably, various Tron-based strategies. The card is also the set's pre-release promo. As for Scars of Mirrodin's other promotional cards, a special edition Steel Hellkite was given to participants of the set's launch party. The set's buy a box promo was a foil alternate art memory side. And the game day event promo was a full art mem night. Also, top eight finishers at game day received a full art foil tempered steel. As for the set as a whole, Magic the Gathering head designer Mark Rosewater calls it a, quote, hard set that was full of, quote, emotional ups and downs. So what's your opinion on Scars of Mirrodin? Please share your thoughts in the comment section below. Also, if you like this video, please give it a like, and remember to subscribe to Magic Untapped here on YouTube. Also, we have a tip jar on Patreon if you'd like to pop a dollar in there and support what we do. Thank you very much for watching.